Hello, your friendly neighborhood host, uh, JT Wheatley here again, back for another episode of the History of Comic Books podcast. This time, the history on crime comic books. The crime genre is as old as fiction itself. One of their first recorded appearances was in the 15th century with broadsheets, which depicted crimes executions at the time. A notable one was in 1635, Murder Upon Murder, committed by Thomas Searwood, alias Courtney Tom, and Elizabeth Evans, alias Cambry Bess, criminal lovers who committed a string of gruesome murders that year. By the late 18th century, James Catnick of uh, London started Seven Dials Press, which published sensational crime magazines from 1792 to 1841, featuring tales about notorious criminals like English highwayman Dick Turpin and Thief Jack Shepard. However, when crime was low, Catnick simply made up criminal tales or just changed the details of past ones to match the locales where his magazines were being published. Catnick was also produced woodblocks depicting these horrific crimes along with the executions of uh, these criminals. By 1841, Edward Lloyd of London published the People's Police Gazette, one of the first popular crime periodicals, which detailed true stories of robberies and lynchings during the 19th century. Four years later, the magazine jumped across the pond to the United States. Before long, the first true detective magazines began to appear in the 1920s and 30s, which featured sensational crime stories covered by grainy photos that were actually posed for by models, though stylized to look real. Of course, newspapers followed suit with numerous stories detailing crimes to grab readers' attention, and it wasn't long before a prominent feature in the papers started to follow suit. The comics page. While comic strips had occasionally addressed crime in stories from time to time, none of them ever took it seriously until Chester Gold brought a certain square-jawed detective to the world. Gold was a 30-year-old Chicago newspaper artist who attempted to become a comic strip artist for some time, but failed for 10 years with his previous attempts, such as The Radio Cats and The Girlfriend, along with a few other strips. Finally, Gold decided to try a serious detective series, purportedly from his frustration when reading about a horrible crime in the papers and wanting the hero to solve it. According to Gold, after uh, putting his wife Edna and the daughter to bed, the strip pr- practically drew itself, and soon his hero's detective's square jaw, aquiline nose, and analytical eyes was formed. First, he was called he was called Plain Clothes Tracy, which he submitted to the Captain Joe Patterson of the Chicago Tribune Syndicate. Gould soon found himself summoned to the Chicago Tribune Taller, who said they liked his stripped idea but thought the name was too long. Instead, Gould should change his first name from Plain Clothes to just Dick, along with adding an origin of Tracy being a cop to avenge his uh, girlfriend's father's murder. Also, he told Gould he would need the first strip in two weeks. Luckily, during Gould's original inspiration, he already created a pile of strips that were ready to go. Thus, Dick Tracy debuted on October 12, 1931, and was noted for his anti-criminal, serious nature. It wasn't the first cr- cr- comic strip to a- do a detective theme, such as Clarence the Cop by Charles Kale, Alice the Cop by Eddie Esk, and Mr. Wise Guy the Detective by Hugh Dole, and the Hackshaw the Detective, a Sherlock Holmes parody by Gus Magger. However, these strips played cops for laughs, often depicting them as incompetent. Dick Tracy was a serious, intelligent detective with a distinctive square jaw and Sherlock Holmes intellect. The early strip was also noted for its early depiction of violence and murder that didn't glamorize crime or criminals, who were depicted as grotesque monstrosities such as the Mole, BB Eyes, and Little Face. Gould said it because, in his opinion, the ugliest face is the face of a killer. The strip had good timing as it emerged during the, book, the big crime wave in the 1930s along with the emergence of the FBI. According to his publisher, the Chicago Tribune Syndicate, Dick Tracy was the antidote to the marvelous sympathy with society's enemies. He creates no glamour for the underworld. Children loved this character and parents and teachers loved to approve of him. Gould also wanted to keep Dick Tracy relevant to the modern world and even took courses on forensics and investigative procedures to further inform the strip. He even introduced a slice of science fiction with Dick Tracy's trademark wristwatch that doubled as a two-way radio in 1946, and the next year a closed-circuit television, both which would later be invented in real life in different forms. Anyone else like anyone else besides me find themselves thinking of Dick Tracy when they use their Apple Watch? Later on, though, the strip would be criticized as being too right-wing and favoring law enforcement over criminals' rights too much, but for the 1930s, it was a perfect crime strip. 
Sure enough, with his second Dick Tracy, imitators followed suit, such as Detective Dan, Secret Operative Number 48, in 1933, a one-shot comic book that was a blatant ripoff of Tracy. The character would later get his own strip, Dan Dunn, Secret Operative Number 48, in September by Norman Marsh at the Human Publication Company. However, this comic book is best noted as inadvertently inspiring Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster to get into comic books, as Siegel reportedly picked up a copy of Detective Dan and took it to Schuster, proclaiming, We can surely do something better than this. That same comic book, though, remains one of the first original comic books of 1933, i.e. one that contained original stories, not just a reprint of comic strips from the newspapers. A higher quality ripoff of Dick Tracy was Secret Agent X-9 by Dashiell Hammett and Alex Raymond, which was released by King Features Syndicates on January 22, 1934. Hammett was the famous mystery author who wrote the classic novels The The Maltese Falcon and The Thin Man, and widely considered one of the finest mystery novels to this day. However, Hammett would have trouble with the daily grind writing comic book strip, and only wrote the first four stories over 16 months. He then left the series due to his inability to meet the deadlines, resulting in being his last published detective work. Alex Raymond was an already a noted artist who at that same month created the legendary Flash Gordon comic book strip. X-9 was a nameless agent, though he used the name Dexter in his first story, for a nameless agency that sometimes referenced the FBI. The series would be renamed Secret Agent Corrigan, short for Feral Corrigan, when Mel Graff took over the series in the 1940s. Graff came up with a name from one of his earlier strips, The Adventures of Patsy. The series would go through many artists over its run, along with producing spin-offs for like radio programs and serials, before finally being cancelled on February of 1996. On March 1934, Red Barry by Will Gould, no relation to Chester Gould, debuted, starring the red-headed undercover cop from King Feature Syndicate. Barry worked alone, with few knowing he was undercover. The series would receive a movie adaptation serial in 1938, but was ultimately ended in 1939. As for Dick Tracy, by the end of 1934, he was called to Washington, D.C. and made an honorary G-Man in his strip and could now cross state lines, which could be a precursor to the G-Man strip in October of 1935 and the Feds on December of 1935. Pulp magazines also celebrated the FBI. It ran a three-page strip, Public Enemies, detailing the, the deaths of criminals like Nelson, with lines like, uh, 16 bullets have perforated his legs and 16th, a 17th have pierced his stomach, spleen and liver. Finish, baby face. Soon, the G-Men got their own strip starring Jimmy Crawford as under her, her, her publications. In 1936, G-Men on the Job by Dick Blair and Milt y- Youngring debuted about Governor Agent Bill, who used modern technology to catch criminals. Secret Agent X-9, now under Charles Flanders and Max Trell, was now an FBI agent who worked for the director, a nod to Hoover, but he was just support staff. Reportedly, FBI Director Herbert Hoover hated the strip because of this. Hoover did admire Dick Tracy and personally wrote to Chester Gould about him. He then wrote to Rex Collier, a journalist who worked with the FBI, to create War on Crime about real criminal cases with the overall intention of presenting the FBI as a well-organized unit finding criminals, i.e. propaganda strip. Kemp Storrett was hired as the artist with the Philadelphia Ledger Syndicate publishing the strip. It debuted on May 1936 with Hoover and the FBI assistant director Clyde Tolson reviewing the dialogue. Collier rewrote the scripts to maintain FBI agents' anonymity, though reportedly Hoover wanted only his name to be known in association with the FBI. The strip would end that same year as nameless agents couldn't compete with Dick Tracy or Secret Agent X-9 as they were allowed to be presented as real, relatable characters readers could identify with. On April of 1934, Radio Patrol debuted, being the first comic strip to star a ununiformed policeman, Sergeant Pat, his partner, Stuttering Sam, and plainclothes policewoman, Molly O'Day. Created by Eddie Sullivan and artist Charles Smith, the strip was originally called Pinkerton Jr. when it debuted in the Boston Herald, since the main character was a boy, Pinky, in 1933, before being renamed after King Feature Syndicate picked it up. Sergeant Pat would eventually become the main character and composite of real-life Boston Police Department officers that Sullivan knew, and would quickly become a popular with the New England audiences. The strip was noted for its realism, especially as depicted of the New England setting, along with Charles Smith slipping in inside jokes. For example, whenever he bought a new car, he would draw that car as Sergeant Pat's new patrol car in the strip. The comic ran to 1950, spawning a radio program and a serial. Of interesting note, Walter Howey, the editor who assigned Sullivan and Smith the job of creating the strip, was a personal friend of William Randolph Hearst, the owner of Hearst Publications, and reportedly the inspiration of Jeb Leland's character in Citizen Kane, who was played by Joseph Cotton. 
Inspector Way by Lehman Anderson, based on the 1929 novel The Indian Rubber Man by Edgar Williams, a Scotland Yard detective, was also a college student in the 1930s. Other notable strips was Jim Hardy by Jim Moores, about a small-town detective, Detective Riley by Jack Kirby, under the then pseudonym Richard Lee, and Be a Detective by Bruce Patterson. Soon, nearly every paper in America had at least one or more crime comic strips dedicated to the crime genre. These strips started to make their appearance in comic books as well, with Dan Dunn appearing in reprints in February 1935 as part of Famous Funnies, while Dick Tracy was reprinted in popular comics on February 1936. Of interesting note, Chester Gold never wrote an original Dick Tracy story for the comic books themselves, but the reprints of the strip alone kept them on the comic book racks for 25 years. War on Crime also appeared in Famous Funnies in October 1936. However, as with comic books in general, it wasn't long before readers weren't just satisfied with reprints, they wanted original stories as well. On January 1936, new comics featured Federal Man by Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster, which would be the first original crime comic book story starring government agent Steve Carlson. They had previously made Bruce Byrne, G-Man of the Future, as a strip ad supplement in 1935. Soon they created Junior Federal Man Club for readers, Federal Federal Man readers, with the intention of driving terror to the hearts of gangland. Siegel and Schuster then created Calling All Cars, which debuted in more fun comics that July, and would later be retitled Radio Squad. Though other writers and artists would soon take over the series, Siegel and Schuster had moved on to a different property altogether at this point. Superman. The Clock by George Brenner was the first mass detective and hero to appear in American comic books, debuting in Funny Pages No. 6 and Funny Picture Stories No. 1 on November 1936, about former District Attorney Brian O'Brien, who died on a blue tux and black mask so that he could fight crime freelance while hiding from the police. He got his name The Clock, as he would tell crooks their time was ticking off while also leaving Colin Clark's The Clock Has Struck, and he even used gadgets while operating from a secret lair. The character has made sporadic appearances in comic books ever since, and to many, the clock is considered the missing link between pulp heroes like The Shadow and comic book ones like Batman. On December of 1936, Detective Picture Stories became the first comic book dedicated to Detective Stories, which included The Clock. It also features stories by Will Eisner, Bob Kane, and others, with features like The Case of the Four Haircuts and Roadhouse Racket and Murder in a Blue Room. Like many comic books before read and after, the comic came with the slogan that it was to show that crime does not pay. On March 1937, Detective Comics was published by Major Malcolm William Nicholson, which would be the, his, one of his final comic books, and Harry Donafeld, the future founder of DC Comic Books, which got his initials from a de- Detective Comics. His first issue featured a story by Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster called Slam Bradley, along with Cosmo and Speed Saunders. Spy was also produced by Schiegel and Schuster about secret agent Burt Regan. As for Slam Bradley, he was a two-fisted detective that emphasized action and power, and Schiegel later admitted that the series was a dry run for Superman. However, the character has maintained appearance in the DC comic books ever since. Detective Comics was edited by Vincent Sullivan, which saw the comic book quickly become the company's top seller. Sullivan asked his old friend Gardner Fox to contribute a story to the comic, which he did with Stephen McClure, D.A., in August of 1938. Other comic book crime fires appeared on June of 1938 was Tom Trailer, G-Man, appearing in Cracker Jack Funnies, and on March 1937, G-Man Jim was produced in the comics magazine. Of course, adaptations from comics and movies were part of the comic book genre as well, with Charlie Tran's strip, based on the det- Japanese detective created by Earl D- Durbiggers, began on October 24, 1938, by Alfred Androlo, whom Biggers picked as the artist, with Kirk Burrow being introduced in 1939. However, following the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, the strip was dropped in 1942. In 1948, Charlie Chan returned to comic books and prize comics by Joe Simon and Jack Kirby, but ended in 1949 after five issues. Charlton would revive the comic in 1955 for four issues, and then DC did the same from 1958 to 1959 with the new adventure to Charlie Chan, meant to be a tie-in in the 1958 TV series. That run lasted for just six issues. Dell also got a return in 1965 for two issues, while Gold Key published a short-lived series based on the Charlie Chan animated series by Hanna-Barbera in the 1970s, called The Adventures of Chan and the, the Chan Clan. Another adaptation came on April 1939 with Gangbusters, based on the popular radio show of the same name that cr- cr- recreated sensationalized accounts of real crimes. The series first appeared in popular comics for DC before getting its own spinoff, which lasted for 67 issues. 
On September 6, 1939, Mr. District Attorney was produced in The Funnies and was also based on the radio series with the same name about Chris Hooting D.A. It would later get its own comic from uh, D.C., running for 67 issues as well, from January 1948 to February 1959. Back in 1938, The Crimson Avenger by Jim Chambers first appeared in Detective Comics number 20 in October, in, in October, starring the Cape Detective Lee Travis, a publisher of the Daily Globe leader. He was a mass detective with a look and method similar to Green Hornet, a popular radio mass detective.